Today's guest is former England captain Mike Bradley. He talks about captaincy in modern day cricket, the role of coaches, captaincy methods, the Kevin Peterson situation, and the impact of social media. Welcome to the show, Mr. Bradley. Thank you. With your tight schedule, how much uh, cricket do you get to watch these days? Not a great deal. I mean, ever since I stopped playing cricket, I've worked as a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, uh, full time, and I'm still working. Um, I don't get much time to watch cricket. I do watch, uh, I like watching test cricket best <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes uh, one day cricket, but not so often. Okay. You are the foremost authority in the world in terms of uh, captaincy in cricket. What are your views on modern day captaincy? You know, is it that much different from your playing days? You know, these days you have three formats more days of cricket being played, more media scrutiny perhaps? Well, we had two formats, but basically um, the job is the same. And the, the job is uh, this fascinating mixture of tactical and technical knowledge and understanding and, uh, and getting the best out of other people, mm-hmm. that combination. And so basically... Um, Andrew Strauss or uh, um, the current England captain, Alistair Cook or uh, Dhoni or any of these people or Michael Clark they, or Graham Smith, they all have uh, that same basic job. Now, I agree with you that, there have, that things have shifted, especially with regard to coaches and backroom staff. And I think that that must be both an advantage for the modern captain. It would be very good to have someone that you could really um, get on with and talk to and who took care of a lot of the things. But on the other hand, it can be a disadvantage if you don't get on together and, and also there's another team that has to be managed. Mm-hmm. I mean, a whole backroom team. We had hardly anyone back backroom when I was playing. <laughs> the primary job and how you carried out uh, in the 70s and the 80s, in terms of how you, what are the things that you had to do, and when you look from the outside now, the things that these captains, the ones that you mentioned at least, have to do, the job description itself has changed, hasn't it? No, I'm saying that basically the job hasn't changed. Basically, you still have to decide whether to have two slips in a gully or whether to bowl this <laughs> bowler from this end or whether someone's tired and needs to be changed or what do you think is a good score with a good approach on a certain pitch, or all the rest of it, you know, all that that's the tactical side. And you still have a great responsibility for influencing the team, for bringing a group of people together into a team that really supports each other, for building up the confidence of some of the people who are less confident, for challenging the overconfidence of some people who get overconfident. I mean, all of that, and trying to play yourself, all these things are absolutely the same. Well, looking from that point of view, you know, the way you describe it, captaincy becomes basically another skill that you expect this person to have, as much as, you know, the uh, abilities with the bat or the ball. But... If you look around, captaincy, at least for a while, it used to be that you know, captaincy was given to whoever that was in form with the bat or the ball. Well, I think that's to undervalue captaincy. And you would think teams should be grooming people into this position. Yes, absolutely. I mean, grooming, trying out, testing, questioning, seeing who's suitable, who might do the job well. And it's a very important part of any team is, to, is the succession, is the next captain, you know, or, the, or the, you know, who's likely to develop into a good captain. And it's a very important part of the, of the development of a team and the continuity of, of excellence. 
let's take a case of, say, India right now with Dhoni being the captain across all three formats. And yeah. right now they're trying to figure out the succession plan. Um, there are calls for his head in at least the tests. What is the sort of thing that you would look in a youngster that might be asked to take up that role? Well, first of all, you look, what sort of a person is he? Is he someone that people will listen to? Is he someone that people will respect? Is he someone who's, who has some desire, I don't mean an overweening ambition, but some desire to stamp his authority on a group of people who has some ideas about how a team should be run, who tactically thinks about the game and has important, interesting, helpful suggestions to make, who can stick at things when things go badly. You know, I mean, there's a whole, whole range of qualities that are called for in a good leader or captain. Now, I mean, so you're looking out for that all the time. I mean, as soon as I became captain of Middlesex, which was in 1971, mm -hmm. um, the, the, one of the most important decisions each year or each two or three years was who would be the best person to be vice-captain. Hmm. And that was partly to do with who would give me the best advice and be good if I was away, but also who would be developed into a good captain. And sometimes you tried things out at that level to see if somebody was going to come through in that way. So I think you're, you, you, you should be thinking about that all the time, as a matter of fact. Not, not, I mean, not all the time, of course, but I mean, it should be on your mind mm -hmm. as an issue. There is a school of thought, and this one has been said by Wazim Akram a, a lot, that bowling captains make for better captains. Well, it's a very interesting idea. And, I mean, I think that uh, the trouble with having a bowling captain, especially a fast bowling captain, mm -hmm. is I think that it, it's asking a great deal of someone to be on the field, where most of the, most of the tactical decisions have to be made, to be on the field, throwing himself into the job of bowling fast, or, uh, which involves a lot of emotion and a lot of physical energy, mm -hmm. both, and at the same time to have that detachment and calm, uh, or element of it, which is required for a captain. Now, on the other hand, I think batting captains often don't understand the bowlers properly. That was one of my difficulties. I don't think I always understood the mentality and feelings of the bowlers. One bowler said to me once, you expect me to be an automaton. Hmm. You know, it was a good comment. And another bowler said to me, a slow bowler said, you expect me to have an attacking field when I first come on, but I need a few balls or an over or two to get my own confidence that I'm bowling all right. I need to have a bit of defense. And I said, well, on the other hand, the batsman is most likely to make a mistake when you first come on. So, uh, you know, it's quite, it, it, that was an interesting debate. But the question of whether a batsman understands a bowler's mentality is, is a good question. But I think the other argument that I gave before about the effort involved in being a captain and how difficult that is when you're at the same time trying to put in peak performance as a fast bowler, mm -hmm. I think it's a strong argument. I mean, there have been great captains who have been slow bowlers. I think of Illingworth and I think of, of Benno mm. from a long time ago. Certainly. You, you bring up a fascinating point, and one of the listeners, Karthikeya, has sent in a question for you. How much of a difference can a captain make if the bowler lacks the control? You mentioned about one of the slow bowlers saying, that he needs protection. Yes. So what can a captain do if he has bowlers Look, that cannot maintain a basic line and length? Well, obviously, you want, you're going to be more successful as a team if you've got bowlers who can bowl line and length. It's a very <laughs> important uh, element. And, and, of course, captains are lucky when they have a bowling attack which has people in it, like, like I did. I had Willis, Botham, Hendrick... Mm -hmm. Lever, Old, and uh, Underwood at times, and Edmonds and Embry. You know, these are, these are people who knew what they were doing. Or imagine having a team that had McGrath and uh, Warren in yeah. it. You know? So <laughs> obviously the job's much easier. But the good captain turns a poor team into a moderate team, a moderate team into a good team, a good team into an excellent team. And a bad captain turns an excellent team into a good team, a good team into a moderate team, a moderate team into a poor team, and a poor team into a hopeless team. <laughs> so, so, you know, of course you, can, you can't do, you can't create miracles, but you can do something. And what you can do is important.
the reason why I got into that is, for example, uh, Dhoni, he was celebrated, he was praised for his, how calm he is, how cool he is, he doesn't mm-hmm. show any emotions. Mm-hmm. Even though he had gotten a team from Anil Kumble that had so many huge stars in it, and they became number one in the world, they won the World Cup, and then now he's being panned for the same exact captaincy style. Yes. Because the, uh, India is not getting the results. Like, yes. how, how does the captain approach that? Yeah, diff- it's difficult. I, I've got two thoughts about it. One is that um, everyone's strengths also include their weaknesses. Mm-hmm. I mean, calmness is a very important quality in, captain, in captains. So is passion. Hmm. Um, so is being really concerned, you know. So sometimes, you know, it, it, it's very difficult to get that balance right. So your calmness can turn into or become a sort of detachment which is not helpful. It can be too fatalistic, non-interventionist. It can be not engaged sufficiently. You know, I'm not saying that about Delhi. I'm just saying that in general. Mm -hmm. Um, And on the other hand, passion can become destructive passion. It can become scapegoating. It can become too angry. You can become too... Uh, exercised about things, you don't have enough detachment or calm. So there's a balance between these things, and no one's going to have everything. It's like you can have an attacking batsman, he won't have a perfect defense. You can have a perfect defense, but he needs a few attacking shots. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's no recipe for these things. And the second thing is that different qualities are called for at different times. And if you have a very good team, the most important thing may be uh, to give them their head to facilitate that. Mm-hmm. You may not need to do very much, but you have to keep making sure people don't get complacent. You have to keep encouraging people who, are, who need encouragement and so on. But it may be a less interventionist job. Mm-hmm. At other times, there may be a crisis. You may, may need to have to take hold of people by the scruff of the neck, as it were, and, and really intervene uh, actively, you may need to change the team. You may need to confront various players. You may need to, you know, have a radical shake-up. So different qualities are called for at different times. I mean, Churchill may have been a very good war leader, <laughs> but he probably wasn't a very good peace leader. Certainly. So, what do you make of the current lot of the cap- international captains around the world? You know, from Clark to Thony to Graham Smith to Alistair Cook. Is there someone that jumps at you? with that style of captaincy that perhaps reminds you of yourself? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't see enough of people close to to be able to answer very solidly. Let me just say, though, that um, Graham Smith I have a lot of time for. Mm. I mean, he's been, he, he became captain of South Africa at the age of 22 or 23. Correct. And he stayed there for, ten, is it 10 years, 9 years, something 10 like years that. now. You know, that is a fantastic achievement, really. And he scored a lot of runs in that time. He's been a very good first slip. You know, he, he's obviously, and he's, a, he's a tough, he's solid, he's, he's thoughtful, he's likable. I think he's respected by the team, and he's managed to maintain that for a very long time mm. in that high-power position. So I must say I take my hat off to him. I thought um, Andrew Strauss was a good captain, yeah. not a genius captain. I don't think he did a very... Uh, unusual or creative or inventive things, but I think as a personality, he won the respect and affection and admiration of his team. Mm. And with, with, with Andy Flower, there was a very good combination of manager and captain in which each helped the other. So that was, so those two I mentioned. The only I don't know enough about. I've mm-hmm. thought he's been a bit laid back in test cricket. I've thought he's done some, he hasn't, uh, he hasn't quite to my mind, tactically, he hasn't quite followed through the possibilities. But uh, that's mm. a rather superficial view. And I think his, his, his willingness to come in at critical situations, his ability as a batsman in particular, but also on the whole as a keeper, and his calmness have been fantastic qualities. And, and you know, to, to, uh, the, the pressure that must be on the captain of India, especially in all three forms of the game, mm-hmm. It is extraordinary. I mean, I heard about that from many people, but one of the people who told me about it was Greg Chappell when he was coach for India. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what it was like for someone like Tendulkar or now Dhoni, you know, in terms of expectation, adoration, uh, intrusion, 
uh, pressure, you know, the number of opportunities there were that could distract you. I mean, it's an extraordinarily difficult job. And I take my hat off to the senior Indian players. I mean, Tendulkar, Dhoni, Dravid, uh, Kumble, for, for keeping and maintaining their, their level of performance at such a high level for so long. I think under great pressure. It's a, that's a perfect segue into the uh, next section, yeah. the chapel. Um, Ian Chapel. anytime you can hear him, anytime he's on the broadcast, where he talks about how a captain of a team should be selected, there is this Aussie way where yeah. they select the best team and then yeah. they select the best player. Of, or yeah. From yeah. The, and yeah. the, it's the English way, which is adopted yeah. by a lot of the other teams as well, which is you pick the captain and the team. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are that in an ideal world, your captain would be a member of the best team and would have been picked as one of the best 11 players. Mm -hmm. But it isn't always an ideal world. And, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's a sort of a balance between the two, that it's, it's very hard to be a good captain if you're not someone yet or actually worth your place in the team. On the other hand, a good captain can transform a team mm. and, and can improve a team, as I've said. And so it's almost like an all-rounder position. So I, I would be inclined to the English way, but you've got to be careful not to go too far in that direction. <laughs> I mean, it's a sort of halfway house, I'm saying, but I, I, would, I, would, I would veer towards the traditional English way. But I can see Chapel's point. And, and, and actually, you know, he was a very good captain. Mm -hmm. He was very tough, down-to-earth, shrewd, uh, uh, ho uh, aggressive. Uh, in a, mostly in a good way, and uh, and and you know respected by the team, mm. and tactically sound. I mean, he, and of course he had some very good players, but he got the best out of them and kept them going together as a team. So he was a very good captain, one of the people I admire. Question comes from another listener, Shoaib. He he wonders about this concept of split captaincy. We have three yes. formats and you have sometimes three different captains. Yes. Um, how does it affect uh, the dynamics within the team, between the players and the captain? I, I don't know fully, but I think it's hard to generalize. I think if there is a good manager, or sometimes now, of course, for England, two managers, mm -hmm. one for one-day cricket and one for test cricket, but if there's a good relationship between the managers... And the captain and the team, captains and the team, I think it can work. If there's insecurity, if there's jealousy, if there's too much rivalry within the team, hmm. then it's going to be a great problem because someone is going to feel, you know, as, as I think happened for Nasser Hussain at the very end of his career, yeah. possibly at the end of his career for Michael Vaughan, they came back into the team for test matches and they didn't think it would feel as though it was their team anymore because somebody else was capturing for either other matches if they'd been injured or for other forms of the game. So in my view, it can work, but it's a bit like having a big backroom staff. You know, you have another problem to deal with, which can be a great source of help, but can lead to insecurity, jealousy, rivalry that can be disruptive. The way the teams are handled now, and this is a question from another listener, Michael Wagner, and... What is your th what are your thoughts on the way the coaches now seem to be more powerful than the captains? Well, I think again, in an ideal world, mm -hmm. you have a sort of you have a a, a a sort of division of responsibilities and a mutual respect. That's the ideal world. The coach would be largely responsible for t for off the field activities, for practice, for nets, for training. Uh, for preparation. Uh, but as soon as you get onto the field or the dressing room just before you go onto the field or in the lunch interval, the captain's the man in charge. And, you know, if they both respect each other, they can have input to the other's job. I mean, the coach can say to the captain, look, you know, I, I thought you didn't really, you missed a chance this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Or the captain can say to the coach, look, you know, there's too much uh, uh, this, this, this training program you've arranged is getting very boring and oppressive to people. We need more va variation, or we need to try different things, or it needs to be more fun, or it needs to relax a bit, you know, or whatever it might be. Or we need to do the, other, the opposite direction. We need to be more rigorous. And, um, so there's mutual input, 
and and that can be a very very good thing. Uh, but in the end, the captain's the person on the field. He's the person who has a sense of how the players are, the bowler is bowling, how the ball's coming through, how who's ready for a change. He he has to have an overall. I think he has to have an overall strategy mm-hmm. as well as a flexibility to what goes on moment by moment. You know spotting weaknesses in the opposition. They'll have done a, I mean the coach can help a great deal with that, you mm-hmm. know, with the, all the all the all the DVDs and the uh, and the internet and the a- access to computers. Mm-hmm. It can be a great help. On the other hand, it can turn people too narrow or too technical and they've got to sometimes have a bit of spontaneity and confidence in doing things their own way as well. So all these things are a matter of balance. It's very hard to 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 prescribe. Mm. All the things that we have talked about so far in terms of captaincy, personnel, uh, on the field, off the field, mutual respect, I think yeah. all, all of that, everything was then forefront during that uh, recent Kevin Peterson saga. The way that things unfolded, the yeah. leaks flying in from all directions. Your take on how Kevin Peterson handled it and how English management, the team management slash the board handled it. Well... My sympathies were largely with the team management, hmm. um, and I thought they handled it pretty well. I mean, I thought I think they they probably. I mean, I've also got a lot of time for Kevin Peterson, by the way. Mm-hmm. I think he's a, a, a remarkable player. I think he turns games around. I think he's capable of doing things that hardly anyone else in the world is capable of doing, if anyone else. Mm-hmm. And um, he's someone you want on your side. He's someone that you want playing for you. He's invaluable to the team. He works very hard at his game. He's not, you know, he's, a, he, he, he's, he's ambitious. He's keen to do very well. He's a... Uh, got good ideas amongst uh, probably got some bad ideas as well, but he's got <laughs> some good ideas, and and you know he's so. But I think there got to be a point where he was doing more damage to the rest of the team than he was doing good, yeah. and I think that that's what the point at which they said enough is enough, and we're not going to have any more of this and these. Whatever these, I don't know what was in these texts, but mm-hmm. I assume they were pretty unpleasant and somewhat, you know, o- o- veering towards the disloyal. Mm-hmm. And I think that at a certain point, the manager and the captain, and probably the team as a whole, felt we're better off without him for the time being. Let him kick his heels for a while. Let him think about what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Let him reflect. Let him see how much he wants to be part of this team, and what is willing to put himself out a bit for the team not just play when it suits him, etc. And and that's what I think happened. And so after a few months, uh, they had some talks, they had some uh, exchanges, they, he, he climbed down to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they've now probably, I don't know, I'm not close enough, but my guess is they've integrated him back into the team. Possibly, he, you know, Andrew Strauss had been putting up with quite a lot from him for some time, and possibly it's easier for a new captain to have mm. a fresh attitude with him, Alistair Cook. You know, that maybe, make, maybe makes things easier for him to come back in. It's a new start. You know, you can... <laughs> Certainly. If you look at the uh, Pakistani team from the 80s, or even the 90s, there were a yes. lot of very headstrong personalities that didn't yes. really get along. Yes. And sometimes were counterproductive. Yes. How far do you put up with it? Or... Yes, as far as you can, is my answer. <laughs> as far as you can. Because you want talented players. You want people to have their own opinions. You want to have uh, people... Are, they, these, are, these are the top players in your country, in the mm-hmm. world, you know? These are, whether it was the Pakistan team of the 80s or 90s, or the England team with people like Boycott, Botham, Lever... Edmonds, Underwood, not. I mean, there were strong characters. Willis, there were strong characters, these people. And mm. you want strong characters. And strong characters are not always going to be easy. And it's the job of the captain and the manager to get the best out of them, to get them basically on side, to get them contributing, to confront them when necessary, and, to, you know, in other words, to manage or lead. So as far as you can, you want to be able to pick your most talented players who are your best players. Now, 
Not always. You can't always do it. You, at least there has to come times where you say, sorry, but you're not going to play for the next match or you're not going to be in the, in the, in the squad for the next foreseeable future until you, until you change your ways in some way or other. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, but that has to be done as rarely as possible because talent is a very, a very rare commodity. Hmm. It's a very valuable commodity. All right. Uh, the next one is about how th- the modern world we live in, and there's a question from James Marsh, and he wonders whether you have any views on challenges posed to the teams, uh, how the business of cricket is conducted, uh, the team chemistry, etc., by social media and the technology. I, I mean, I suppose there are one, there's more than one aspect to this question. I mean, I, I imagine that the most... The most destructive use of mobile phones and so on is in terms of corruption. Hmm. And I think this is the biggest threat to cricket. Mm-hmm. Um, because if corruption is around, you know, if it, if it gets at all bad, it destroys the confidence of the public in the game. Mm-hmm. Because they can't be sure what to trust. It seems to me that it's the most important, the most crucial question facing, the issue facing cricket now. Social media in terms of the mobile phone and small computers of one kind or another that can be used to give information or to communicate with gamblers or whatever it might be, or bookmakers, is a very, it's a very difficult area because on the one hand people have their private lives, they have to, you know, they, they're still human beings, they've still got friends and wives and girlfriends and all mm-hmm. sorts of things and arrangements and managers and agents and people they have to do business with and all sorts of things, friends, and, and they want a life. And on the other hand, you have to have some caution in, in what's allowed. Mm-hmm. So that's the most obvious danger of the social media. The other thing, is, I suppose, is to do with what people say, uh, foolish things they say <laughs> or you know, uncharitable things they say that suddenly get around the world, whereas before they might say it, to one or two people and it gets around a pub mm-hmm. now it gets around the world you know so I, I, I think it is, a, it is a, a, a sort of difficulty in the modern world it's a difficulty that confronts anyone in public life I mean politicians or actors or mm-hmm. you know it's, it's, a, it's not just sportsmen that it, that it confronts from this point of view and I don't know how you you, you know you have, obviously have to live in this world and you have to try and create an atmosphere in which people respect the rest of their team and are alert to how a casual comment can be taken up and can be put into headlines across the world within seconds. And the social media, see, I, I suppose it's a difficulty for the, for the media themselves because, you know, if you're writing an article, at least you have some time for second thoughts. If you're talking on the radio or the TV, you don't have time for second thoughts. And if you're tweeting all the time, mm-hmm. it's even more, you know, it feels like you're saying something to your best friend. Well, you're not. You're saying <laughs> something to the world at large. And, and so I think life's difficult in that way. But, I mean, that's the world we live in. Finally, this is on uh, your book, The Art of Captaincy. Yeah. And it's a question from Nishanth, and rather common too, looking at how captaincy is being handled by various people across the world and how man management is usually generally getting screwed up, you know, with this England situation or any, basically you can take any team around the world in the last 10, 15 years, you can see many instances of that. He wonders whether you were so far ahead of your time, the book was, and how it still might be. <laughs> well, it's very kind of him, I think, but I, I, I think there's, there's always been, in every team you get, in every class, in every business board, in every group of actors, in every family, you get conflict. And conflict's not a bad thing. Conflict's necessary, tension is necessary, argument is necessary, different opinions are necessary. But hopefully, uh, overall, the, the balance is for the good, it's for the good of the team or the family or whatever it is. Sometimes it isn't. Now, I don't think it's changed in that way. I think there's always been this. It's just that it becomes a little bit more of it gets out now or is more public. Hmm. I don't think it's um, particularly different. So I think that the, 
if I was writing about, you know, the, 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 the tensions, the, the, the liveliness, I mean, I think a good team is often a team with lots of strong personalities, like a good family is a family with lots of strong personalities, but that overall there's respect for the whole family and for each other. And, and that, within that, you can accommodate argument, debate, difference of opinion, elements of conflict, degrees of jealousy or envy. You know, these things are inevitable. Insecurity, overconfidence, a bit of brashness. <laughs> All these things come into, into human life, and they come into cricket teams. And you're never going to get rid of them, and you don't really want to, because that's what life is, and that's what humans are. And the thing is to get the best out of it. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time, Mr. Braley. I really Okay, well, it's a pleasure, and uh, uh, thank you for your, for your questions, and thank you to the people who, who sent questions in. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers. Oh, just they went down the ground. This could be six as well. It's a big A. It's a huge six. Straight down the ground, almost into the dressing room. And that tells the story. What an innings this is. What are Eunice's being slaughtered? Couch Talk.